um, there are people that really are followers of all of you and appreciate and read your books. And there are pre people on this call who <clears throat> barely know who you are, haven't read your books. They eat their regular diet. They're very happy with their diet. They're not looking to change. They like chicken. They like fish. They like what they eat. They're trying, you know, their best, but they're not really being sold. Like if you say, do you want to smoke cigarettes? A lot of them would say, well, no, the, the, the negatives outweigh the benefits. I'm not going to smoke cigarettes. But a lot of people are saying, I don't really know what the negatives are. Now, let's leave the environmental discussion out and let's leave the animal cruelty discussion out. Mm -hmm. For people who are just saying, look, I don't really get it. Like why, what's in it, what's, what's the benefit? I, I'm totally okay with my chicken Parmesan and whatever I'm eating. So the real question is not just very direct science on the question of obesity, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, um, heart disease, cancer, not the theory, what are you saying is going to be different in their life? And the two questions are maybe, Will, you can answer one and Brian the other and Anna Marie the, the other. So one question is, if they switch to a whole food plant-based diet, what happens compared to what happens compared to their current diet on heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, all these things? And then the same question for a whole food plant-based raw diet. So again, they're not, these people aren't necessarily looking for inspiration or motivation. They're fine. They just don't know exactly what the science says. They want to live a long, healthy life. And if they think they're going to live it eating what they are, they're not going to change. So there's three, three options. One, continue eating their normal diet and assume it's not a terrible standard American diet. Assume they've given up soda and sugar, but they eat animal products as a regular part. The second is they summon switches to a whole food plant-based diet. And the third is someone switches to a whole food raw diet. What specifically should they expect different in these three scenarios on each of these diseases as specifically as you can so someone could evaluate if they want to put the effort? Dr. Tuttle, you start. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I think essentially... Um, when someone is eating the, the diet you're talking about, which people think is a sort of a healthy diet. Dr. Tull, can, uh, you, can you make your microphone a little louder? Yeah. Okay, when they, and they're eating what they think is a healthy diet. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, we don't really, the, you know, the average person in the United States is on, I, I forget the number, but it's like by the time they're in their 60s, they're on, you know, maybe at least uh, half a dozen or a dozen medications for various things. And that's considered to be pretty healthy, you know. <laughs> so I think you know, we have to understand that the bar right now, in many ways, is pretty low. Uh, people really, a lot of people have no idea what radiant health is. But but what if you know the sense of, of being filled with energy and exuberant and not being sick or going to the doctor. Uh, and I, I'm so grateful. I, back in my, when, in my 20s, I became a vegan. And in, in the early days, I somehow learned to stay away from processed foods as well. And I have to say, I remember really quite honestly, I haven't been to uh, the doctor for my health really since uh, I was in college, which was back in the, um, in the se early 70s. And so it's been a, like 50 years and uh, so to be able to go 50 years without health insurance, without um, going to a drugstore, without buying uh, Right Guard and Rolaids and Alka-Seltzer and aspirin, and I don't even know what these things are, what they do, uh, the, all these different things that people, Viagra, you know, whatever people think they need, you know, it's, uh, there's a tremendous, I mean, that's, you, you can't put a price on that. You know, they, uh, that, that old saying that the greatest wealth is your health. Um, it really is. I mean, it's a foundation for everything else. Like Albert Schweitzer said, the key to happiness is good health and a short memory. And good health and a short memory go together. But a short memory is being present, which is very important to be healthy, but also um, the, the right nutrition. And so moving to a plant-based way of eating, it does so many things at once. You know, basically you're going from eating you know, high on the food chain, anyone eating any animal foods, you're eating high on the food chain 
toxins concentrate as you go up the food chain. So all the heavy metals, PCBs, dioxin, nuclear radiation, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide residues, you know, all the over 80,000 different toxic chemicals that concentrate in the earth or the soil, the water, the air, it ends up in animal-based foods. All these animals, most people don't realize that cows and pigs and chickens are being fed fish to, you know, to fatten them up and to make them give more milk and more eggs. So fish concentrate heavy metals and dioxin, PCBs and all kinds of stuff. And so it's concentrating so much in these foods. So it's basically the concentration of toxins. I would say that's the big thing. So eating an organic whole food plant-based way of eating, we're cutting the, the toxin load on a massive scale. And we live in a society that does not really tell us. I just read an article like right before this, um, this call that scientists are discovering uh, that the, the amount of toxic chemicals in people's bodies has been really underestimated. People, the doc, you know, scientists have really underestimated the amount of toxins in people's bodies and the impact that it's actually having. And that's understandable because if you, you tell people how many toxins are in their bodies from chemicals, then the chemical industries are going to be responsible. But we don't want you know, the chemical industries and the banks in the background, they don't want to be responsible. The drug industries, they want everybody to think that the problem is not chemicals. The problem is viruses and bacteria, because then we can have drugs. <laughs> we can have vaccines <laughs> and drugs to go against those. Well, that's good, right? And that just makes more money for the chemical industries, more money for the pharmaceutical industries, more money for the bankers in the background. Everybody's happy. But our, he our health goes down, down, down. And we don't get the truth. That's why this is so important, I think, to have uh, this kind of a forum where we can question where the information is coming from. So animal-based foods uh, concentrate these toxins that are environment that are put into the environment uh, purposefully to, to basically switch the foundation of our agriculture from soil to oil. That's what's happened. And so we're now, the soil is dead, the microorganisms are dead, people are eating animal-based foods that are, and these animals are being fed uh, genetically engineered corn and soy and alfalfa and other feed grains that are absolutely toxic in the, in the amount of uh, pesticides and herbicides that are dumped on them. And all of that ends up in the flesh and so these animals concentrates in them, especially in the fat. And then people love the fat, of course, and the dairy and the cheese and the eggs. It all concentrates. So that's number one. Number two, there's over 10,000 different chemicals and hormones and antibiotics that have been approved uh, to be used on the animals themselves. So these animals are sitting on farms and they're getting injected force vaccinated they don't have a choice right they're getting injected with all kinds of of toxins it's over like now it's up to 90 percent of all the antibiotics used in the united states are put onto these animals so all these antibiotic residues there's a whole slew of different uh hormones that are forced on these animals to make them grow faster give more milk get pregnant earlier all kinds of things that are given to these animals stress hormones anti-stress hormones all of that stuff so all of these residues are ending up in the food. And then uh, the, the poor people themselves eat this stuff and then they get drugged by the doctors, right? So they need medications for their diabetes and for their, for their uh, high blood pressure and uh, cancer, all these things. So uh, all these toxins have huge effects on us. Our bodies are trying to cleanse toxins. That's what our bodies do. That's the main thing they're doing. And so we have an allopathic system in place that profits off of this. You have to really understand this. The money is, runs perfectly for this. And my father owned a whole chain of newspapers. So I understand how the media works. My father, I, I grew up sitting around the table. I learned, he would talk about this with my, with my mother, that well, we can't run that article because the so-and-so, the advertiser, wouldn't like that. So we're not going to run that article. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how it is. And that the, the news that we're getting, the mainstream media, all of our sources, it's, it's, it, you can't get anything in the mainstream media that the big advertisers don't want you to hear. And who are the biggest advertisers? The fast food industries, the chemical industry, the drug industries, the bankers in the background, the petroleum industries that, that are behind all this too. So we have to get our information somewhere else. And a lot of it we have to get from our intuition, from our inner wisdom. And also by listening to people like the people who are running Hippocrates Health Institute, for example, it's probably the cutting edge leading uh, alternative health uh, care uh, center in the, in the United States, maybe in the world, where people are actually having tremendous success. And 
I think we can each one of us in the laboratory of our own experience discover that there's a huge difference between be, getting through the day and really being healthy. It's kind of like, you know, if you're wearing shoes all the time and they're too small, but you get used to it, you don't realize it. And then one day you take those shoes off. It's like, woohoo, man, no, it's like I can dance, I can jump, I'm, I feel so great. Yeah, I never realized it. You know, I just never knew I, my shoes were too tight and I, I was kind of hobbling around here and I got used to it. You know, we get used to having a lousy health pretty much. P most people around us, they all do that, right? We're, we're not that healthy as a society. And so people get used to that kind of everybody's overweight. Someone who's really radiantly healthy and alive is uh, usually not that, not that often seen. So I think the whole idea of, is to question all the official narratives in the society and move away from dead, toxified foods, what passes for food in, in most of the grocery stores. And I would say 95% of it, when I go into a store, there's no food in there, <laughs> except for maybe a little bit at the, at the edges. Uh, most of it you can't, you can't buy. It's not food. I would never even consider it food. But, the, but, I, but then I, I'm behind people at the checkout and they're actually eating this stuff. And I, I want to shake them in a way and say, what are you, don't you realize what you're doing? But you know, it's, the problem is we're all brainwashed. A um, uh, better word, I think, is brain poisoned um, by the ma mainstream media and by the medical establishment that is controlled by the pharmaceutical industry. And so we, we have to take responsibility ourselves for our own health and question these things and move to an organic whole food as much as possible, local uh, plant-based way of eating. And de definitely the, the mo most, most of it, I would say, uh, uncooked. I mean, that's really, you know, that's, that's very important to have living foods that are fresh and alive. I mean, this is the foundation for fantastic health and we, everyone can work and, and try it uh, for themselves, especially with guidance like we're getting here, uh, I think from, these, from everybody here today. Mm. So if you, if you don't care, let's say to be selfish, let's say we don't care about the cruelty, the unbelievable cruelty, the rape, the murder that's going on in farm, um, farms, especially for farm animals that have nobody to look after them, FDA, EPA, APCA, nobody looks after them. They're totally on their own. But let's say one word, microbiome. So microbiome is your environment. That's your flora. That is so important because 70% of your whole immune system, your, your T cells are made in the lining of your gut. And 90% of your serotonin is made there. You eat meat, you mess it up. You eat chicken, you eat eggs, you have dairy products. You have a saturated, filthy place of parasites, fungus, mold, bacteria, and virus. And that's what, that's what feeds every disease, every disease. And there's no such thing as organic. Uh, I write about that in several of my books, uh, Dairy Deception, Killer Fish, Poison Poultry. Uh, the whole sham for yuppies, uh, organic foods, uh, this is a, a criminal act. That's all I can say. So now to answer specifically your question, Stephen, you said, look at the diet that's moderately good compared to what smoking and drinking every day and eating McDonald's, and then a cooked vegan diet that many of the people you invite to real truth as authorities advocate, and then the living food diet, uh, which is the, you know, the one that was given birth with lifestyle medicine here at Hippocrates. And let's start by saying, uh, how many of you would like a four time greater chance for reaching 80 years old after 50? I think everyone would say yes. If I'm 50, I would really at least like to be 80. Well, uh, just eliminate meats the ones Anna Maria just mentioned. That's red meat, uh, pork, chicken, turkey, and add in an onborn meat there called eggs. And we know statistically from a wonderful study that was done, that's what's going to be achieved. A four time greater chance to reach 80 years old if you give up these flesh-based and dairy foods. Number two, a study came out of Brigham's University in Utah, 
that looked at the DNA of chicken and looked at cancer in the breast. And the very DNA of the chicken people consumed were in the cancer tumors. So this is a done deal. This is no longer, well, we're not sure, we need more research. Baloney, 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 and don't eat that either. This is real stuff that we're talking about. Look at the World's Health Organization that talked about the dramatic increase in colorectal cancer from eating meats. And they were very conservative on this. They said you had a 15 percent higher chance if you ate. Listen to this. Listen to this. One meal of meat a week. Now, who the heck does that? My entire diet was meat at one point. One meal of meat a week. One meal of meat, you have 15 percent higher chance of getting cancer. Now, if you add bacon in there, it's even worse. So the what we call the treated meats, the lunch meats, the salami, bologna, kabasi, you know, cured ham, whatever these things are, you know, this dramatically multiplies the chances of numbers of forms of cancer. This is research we're giving you out of the highest levels of research institutes on the planet Earth. And why we don't talk about this, we don't know. Well, Will Tuttle just told us because he came from a family that was in the media and he was a little boy in Massachusetts. He heard his dad say 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we can't put that article in there because our advertisers will not stick with us. You don't think that's going on with national and international TV? Of course it is. You guys are being conned. Now, let's go back to 1917. That was more than 100 years ago. That was the very first year that the meat and dairy industry started to bankroll academic books. So they went to Scholastics and said, you're struggling. You don't have money. We love children. We want them to have education. And we'll pay for a big percentage of these books, providing, providing you let us add the nutritional components in. Now, these are academics. They knew nothing about nutrition. So they started to hijack it. They took the 12 food group, which one was meat and dairy. Then it became one was meat, one was dairy. And just for the hell of it, they threw vegetables and fruit in. <laughs> the reality that happened 105 years ago. That's what we're talking about. So you and I as little girls and little boys and Anna Marie and I getting our doctorate degree in nutritional science. We're PhD nutritionists had that same propaganda in the books from kindergarten through doctoral programs. That's why you believe this. Then to top it all off, if you were lucky like both of us, we had parents that loved us. They were good people. But boy, they were Till of the Hun and Jack the Ripper when it came to food. <laughs> and I can tell you, my mother taught me one thing as a boy. Love meant food. If I love you, I give you food. If you love me, you eat the food. It's an unspoken international conversation we're having. So my mother, who loved me and I trusted, and on my developmental years, here I'm a little boy, the first six years of life, you develop 85% of your personality. Listen, people. My mother told me meat was good for me. Then I went to school, and at six years old and seven years old and eight years old, my teacher told me my masculinity, my malehood, my machiboism depended upon me eating the flesh of an animal. Then I watched movies. And in those movies, I saw cavemen. I used to pretend to be a caveman. And I would take the leg of a chicken. Boy, those big legs around Thanksgiving with the turkey. And I'd eat them. Because I wanted to be a man. I wanted to be masculine. So all of this propaganda went on. And what's ironic is the more meat you eat, the more feminine you are, because they inject those things with female hormones to fatten them up. What's ironic, the more milk you eat, the more osteoporosis and arthritis you'll get. Read the work of Dr. Campbell, the most important work ever done in the field of nutritional science, published as a scientific document in 1990, the China study. Who's going to argue with that other than Egghead intellectuals who know nothing from nothing. 
He actually went around, did data and statistics around the world. In the countries where people ate more meat and more dairy, more cancer, more heart attacks, more strokes, more diabetes. In the countries that eat the least, they had practically or virtually none of them. When I go out and I speak at medical conferences, I leave this for the slow-minded, only the doctors, because the rest of you get this stuff. And I actually do an inverted pyramid. And at the very bottom of that tip of the pyramid are countries that eat plant-based diets. They have no cancers to speak about. At the very top, now we get to the big countries, United States, Europe, Australia, Argentina. That's where the largest amount of cancers are. People, this is no longer debatable. You're just looking for somebody that's gonna tell you what you want. I'm telling you what you need to hear, not what you wanna hear. You want science? You're gonna to have to extend this program for the next 10 years and Anna Marie and I will sit here and give you science study after science study after science study. And if, by the way, you're really interested in this, I write book for you eggs heads. It's called Food is Medicine. It's a three volume academic series just for people who like to doubt truth. And in there, I document study after study from the highest universities and the highest laboratories on the planet Earth. Now, if that's not enough, it's because you have two things going on. You're addicted to it. You're not having a value-driven lifestyle with integrity where you say, even though I like the taste of it, even though I know it's bad for me, I don't have the guts to change it. And number three, it's much easier to go along with everyone else than to stand out. But the good news is, really good news, the young, young people today here and in Europe and in Israel even more, 50% of them aspire to be plant-based eaters. That's remarkable to me. So 50% of the youngest people who are adults today say, I want to be a vegan. That's a good news. And those of you that aren't really thinking openly and widely about this kind of transformation into the world that we need to move into, not only to save your butt, but to save the butt of the planet Earth and all the creatures that we kill unnecessarily, you're gonna be left behind. The train's going, we're all on the train, and by the way, it's a nice ride. It's very scenic. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You know, I, I just want to add maybe w one thing. There's um, a saying in uh, in many, I think, I, I know it's in the Dhammapada, the Buddhist tradition. I think it's a, 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 a truism or truth, a spiritual truth uh, in many spiritual traditions. And it, it's basically that um, if, a, if a person hears that they can have uh, a higher pleasure or higher well-being by giving up a lower pleasure, then... The, you know, as a wise person, they would do that. And I think this is really in many ways what it comes down to. There's certain levels of pleasure, I think, like being comfortable, going along, eating what everybody else eats, having comfortable food. And, the, and people think that that's a, a pleasure that they don't want to give up and don't realize that there's this high, it's a, it's a, it really is a certain type of pleasure. It's not, I, pleasure is not really the right word, but a higher pleasure or higher well-being that... I mean, like for me, I, you know, the idea of eating meat or, <laughs> or dairy or uh, any of these things like smoking or drinking or whatever, it's like, um, it's, it, it's such a, such a, it would be such a come down. And I think uh, the idea is that we are here on this earth to evolve uh, in, in our understanding and to help uh, work together to build a world uh, of harmony and peace and justice and freedom and creativity and joy and celebration. And so all of our choices in our, in our daily lives, uh, I think, uh, as Brian and Anna Marie are saying, uh, we have these values, to have our values uh, be aligned with our actions. And so if I'm eating foods that come from misery, and there's no way, I mean, we all know that, if, if I'm eating the flesh of an animal, wherever it came from, a being was killed. So not only are there these physical toxins that I was talking about, uh, and we've been talking about the concentrated uh, toxins that the animal was eating and drinking and breathing, all of that, uh, and also the whatever drugs and hormones they were given, 
But there are also what I refer to in the World Peace Diet as metaphysical toxins we're eating. And I think this is maybe the worst in some ways because we're eating terror and fear and despair and anxiety and frustration and, and misery. And how can we expect to build a temple? And our body in many ways is a temple, a temple for the spirit, a temple for our, our beautiful consciousness. We're here functioning through our, our physical body. And you would think, I think our intuition knows this, that we would be very in a sense, right? We, if we're building it, you're building every day this temple, this, this vehicle to use bricks that are of the quality that you'd like to use to have a beautiful, powerful, creative vehicle to use. So why, why would we ever this temple misery and horror and pain and suffering? Uh, that is completely contrary to our natural wisdom. The only way we do it is that we suppress our intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main problem that happens in our society, our institutions. I think especially the educational, I have a PhD in education. I mean, our educational system in many ways is designed, unfortunately, to reduce our intelligence. The basic rituals in our society, you know, eating animal foods, it reduces our intelligence. Intelligence is the capacity to make relevant connections. But every, if I'm eating meat, like we're saying, oh, it's a, you know, we're, we're taught, oh, it's, it's a good food. We're good people. We like to eat uh, a good steak and have a milkshake. And we, uh, we uh, create this uh, disconnect, right? We just disconnect from the animal and the suffering and we stay shallow and we don't want to make the connections. But intelligence is the capacity to make relevant connections. So as a society and as individuals, we are, with every meal, if we're eating animal foods, we're reducing our actual, not only our cognitive intelligence, but our, our emotional intelligence, our ability to feel compassion and empathy. We just learn to glaze over our eyes and go numb. And we see the cows in the field and we think, well, I don't care about them. We think about the chickens and the pigs that we're eating. Well, I don't care about them. We think about the people that are starving because most of the food we're growing, we're feeding to these animals while people are going hungry. Well, I don't care about them. And we think about the indigenous people who are being destroyed and we don't care about them. We think about the slaughterhouse workers who have to stab animals all day and have the highest rates of injury. Well, I don't care about them. And pretty soon we don't care about our, even ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the big problem. We don't care about ourselves enough and about others around us. So what we're talking about really is uh, not only a, a nutritional transformation, but I think really a spiritual and psychological and cultural transformation to care uh, about others and about ourselves and then to see with new eyes, to see that we're all interconnected and that when we create a foundation uh, of foods that we're eating and see that nutrition is not reductionistic. Uh, our whole science is based on reducing everything. It's based on materialism, that, there's n that consciousness doesn't matter, that we're just, you know, when a baby is born, when a, a sperm and egg come together, then it's just these cells that sort of randomly connected. And then these cells are multiplying. And then pretty soon, just because of DNA, they make some kind of little meaningless organism, this little, this little body that now has to just try to trans, he's just going to try to uh, compete with others and pass on his genes. And it's all meaningless in a meaningless universe. I mean, this is the kind of toxic narrative. It's the background of our entire society. And we have to question all of this, this reductionism, because we reduce animals to objects. Pretty soon we reduce our food science to just this reductionistic looking at vitamins and minerals. And we don't see the whole, the whole symphony of life and our harmony with nature and our connection with animals and the earth and the beauty. And this is what I think really make, brings health. When we rediscover uh, the deeper truths of our being and see our connection with life. And then uh, we don't, we don't have, we don't want that lower pleasure. We see there's a much higher pleasure uh, of feeling wonderful about the fact that we're in this beautiful planet. We're doing the best we can to contribute to the solutions that are here. We're doing the best we can to be kind and loving to other beings, especially those who are vulnerable. Our life has meaning and a purpose. I mean, this kind of a pleasure, it's like infinitely beyond the pleasure of like, wow, I just like the taste of cheese or whatever. I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't even, nauseatingly ridiculous to try to compare those. 
And I think this is, we have to awaken out of this cultural trance where uh, we've lost track of what it is to be a human being and be part of a benevolent unfoldment of life here and, and begin to exemplify that more in our that own life. Good, a good segue to answer the last part of the question. So what differentiates the uh, moderate animal-based diet and the plant-based cooked diet and now the living diet? Uh, what Dr. Tuttle just explained to you is in a scientific way, photonic. So you have photons that come from these plants if they're unprocessed, uncooked, that bring literal light and energy into the human cells. And they are the foundational fuel to develop consciousness. And consciousness is not something within us, it's something we connect to. So to have living plants, the diet that we were meant to eat, uh, there's no doubt in any serious anthropological mind today, in the beginning of the 21st century, that we were plant eaters. We were not hunters and gatherers. That was a false scenario come up with in Oxford back in the 19th century. And now the relevant research that's been done today has proven that on a biological basis. But more important, and I do agree totally with Dr. Tuttle, is we've got to allow ourselves to be liberated from the pain and suffering of our own inherent patterns of deception. That we have literally created false paper tagger lies. And we don't feel good. And we're confused. And we just have no relations with other people that's deep and authentic and honest. And it's time that we stop that and we, we leave behind the fear and we start to trust ourselves and trust others and realize everything can be perfectly fine. But the act of stopping murderous activity is the number one thing we must do. To abuse anyone to gain benefit is a crime as far as I'm concerned. Right. If we abuse a human being, uh, you know, and there's plenty of that going on, believe me, we have more slavery today as we speak than we've ever had in the history of humanity. We have more sex slavery than we've ever had in the history of humanity. We have more racism than we've ever had in the history of humanity. And it's time that we have love and we have peace and we have a planet that we, we cherish, a mother that we respect. She's given us life. If you believe in God, and many of you purport you do, I just don't believe it, frankly. You have to resonate with these things. You were given everything you need, and we're just abusing it. And we're abusing the greatest gift, your life. By self-abuse, you're spitting in the face of the universe and God. And it's unnecessary. I've had the privilege my whole life to watch the liberation of people. The entire mission statement of Hippocrates Health Institute is liberate humans and the environment. That's all we do here is liberate you from your own patterns of deception. And when you do that, we all as a human race will liberate the environment to once again get back to the paradisical ideology that God gave us. And we pay a huge price. We pay with uh, our body. Of course, uh, on a meat diet, I need doctors. I need pharmaceutics. I need surgeries. I lose my gallbladder. I lose my appendix. I might lose the breast. I might lose my ovary. I might lose my prostate. We just keep cutting, cutting, cutting. For what? When, when these are things that comes from a meat fish, chicken, dairy, egg diet. It's very, very, very much so. So don't just stand where you are and say, this is an interesting conversation. Dr. Tuttle and Anna and I are not saying we're elitist and we're better than you. We're you. We came from exactly where you're from. We did exactly what you did. And we're humbled by the fact that you're listening to us. So all of us and many more open our arms and welcome you to the human race of the 21st century. 
I'm an optimist. I think we're well on our way. I think everything's going to be fine. We're just going through turmoil at this point because too many of you are lost without values. Gain the values by acting in a way with integrity and humility. So Thank when... Can I just say one quick thing? <laughs> um, I, you know, I think one, one important aspect here, and it's, it's so great to share these ideas, um, is to feel into, again, this ancient spiritual teaching. Uh, I refer to it in the World Peace Diet as the boomerang effect. Whatever we sow, we reap. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the animals that we're eating, if we're eating animal-based foods, um, these animals are forced into situations that we would not want to be forced into. And they're actually um, having the same diseases that we're getting. Like we, we, we sow the seeds. For example, uh, we have this obesity epidemic, right? And there's, there's, no matter what we do, if you look at the graphs of obesity over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it, it's always going up. It just keeps going up and up and up and up. So what are we doing? So we have that problem. What are we doing? We have literally billions of animals who we have confined for one purpose. They're sold by the pound. We want to make them as obese as possible, as quickly as possible. We have whole armies of scientists and researchers that study lighting schedules and uh, breeding practices and feeds, uh, how to feed and drugs and hormones and all kinds of things to just get these animals as fat as possible, as quickly as possible, because that's where the money is. And so we sow the seeds of obesity in billions of animals, and we think in our delusion that we're going to be not have obesity, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're causing obesity. As you sow, so shall you reap. The same thing with, uh, like, for example, osteoporosis. We have this situation. Some of you have seen this in, in maybe some of the undercover videos, but we're constantly sowing uh, osteoporosis, uh, seeds of that, in, especially in dairy cows, pushed to give much more milk than they normally would. And so these poor animals are pregnant and lactating simultaneously. They're giving uh, you know, uh, up to 100 pounds of milk a day when they normally would only give it the most, maybe 20 or 25 pounds of milk a day. So uh, calcium is being leached from their bodies on a massive scale. And these cows have severe osteoporosis. Many of them, when they get to the slaughterhouse, when they're only five years old, they're sent off to slaughter, even though they would normally live to be 25 years. And very often they become downers. It happens all the time. Their bones just break because they have such severe osteoporosis. So they're being pushed by these forklifts into the slaughter lines. It's terrible. And chickens also, their bones break them all the time because they're forced to overproduce eggs. So all the calcium, there's a lot of calcium in eggshells. So they, again, have severe osteoporosis. So we're forcing osteoporosis on billions of animals, and we get an osteoporosis epidemic. We force cancer. And these animals are living in the most toxic environments you can imagine. They're eating toxic food. They're under incredible stress. They're literally driven into insanity, banging their heads against the bars, uh, and we're eating uh, cancer. We, they, they cut the tumors off the flesh. They're supposed to, but th there's all kinds of cancer in the flesh that we're eating in the and uh, we find a cancer epidemic and we force these animals into terrible psychological conditions. And we find, again, the, the biggest profits that the pharmaceutical industry makes are for pharmaceutical products, drugs, for people with the same things we're inflicting on the animals. The chronic pain, chronic despair, insomnia, depression, stress. You know, this is what we force billions of animals into. Why do we think we're not gonna have the same thing happening to us? This is the basic thing that we have to understand is that we live on a beautiful, abundant planet. We can feed everyone on a fraction of the land if we would merely sow the seeds that we would like to reap ourselves. If we want to be free and, and healthy, we can be free and healthy. But if we sow the seeds of slavery and misery and disease in billions of animals who don't want to be enslaved, who don't want to be unhealthy, who do not want to have their babies stolen, who do not want to have their families destroyed... What's going to happen? We're going to find war and terrorism and destruction of our families and, and, and being forced medicated ourselves like we do to the animals. So we're, we're at a point now uh, where uh, it's really critical for us to waken out of the fact that this is an obsolete system that we've been born into. We don't have to uh, blame uh, ourselves. We have to just see this and understand it 
and let it go, right? Not cooperate with it. And, and realize uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we've talked about these different toxins, but to just to say that organic meat, organic dairy, organic eggs, maybe they don't have as many toxins, but there are inherent toxins. For example, dairy, the main protein in dairy is casein. And casein is a huge, gigantic protein molecule that we don't have renin, which is the enzyme that breaks down casein like little calves have. We don't have that. So anyone eating dairy products, especially cheese, which has a lot of casein uh, and, and, and yogurt and so forth, we're getting a molecule that we don't have the enzyme to break down. It wreaks havoc. We're not little calves. We, we should not be eating this. And even the basic proteins in meat, for example, they're very large proteins. So a lot of people think, well, I'm eating meat and dairy. I'm getting good, high quality protein. We have to realize that we're not designed to eat those kind of large, complex <laughs> molecules that are difficult to break down. Plant-based proteins uh, are much easier for us to break down into the essential amino acids that we can recombine to create the hundreds of thousands of different proteins that we need to create to be healthy. So plant-based protein is much higher quality. Plant-based uh, uh, fatty acids are much higher quality. Plant-based uh, you know, fiber and carbo carbohydrates, all these things. Animal-based foods, even, even if somehow we could, they could be lovingly done or whatever, which they can't, they're still inherently toxic. They're inherently not what we're designed for. So it's very important to see these different levels and see the bigger picture uh, on every level that when we move away from violence, when we move away from animal-based foods, on every level, we're reducing the variety of toxins and we're embracing an, an exemplary way of positive. It's, uh, it's a really profound uh, misunderstanding that our society labors under. And it's amazing that it continues. You know, it, it's, that's the real question. And why does it keep continuing? Why are we as rational beings still hanging on to something that's so profoundly, obviously irrational. And I think that's where uh, what Dr. Um, the, uh, Brian and Anna Marie are, are, are talking about, that there's a, a certain type of addiction that perhaps goes. And also the idea uh, that we, these kinds of food give us love because that's what our mother did and we want to fit in and we don't we want to just comply and go along and and eat what we've always eaten so uh to just take time to look deeply and realize that we are responsible for our food choices and as we sow so shall we reap that's the underlying you know, teaching here too before we go to the next question uh, <laughs> uh dr wilcox out of harvard university said it beautifully i quote him in one of the presentations i make he said, you know, we think we got one over on the animal. The animal gets us back. We kill the animal and it literally kills us. 